call the meeting to order and uh, we just need a roll call of um, membership so starting online with Brittany here Dan here Ed here and Bruce so tonight we have um, we have a lot of things on our agenda tonight a lot of it is um, introduction I just wanted it to be part of the packet so we could introduce the subject and then when we meet next month um, we'll have some more participants that will um, you know kind of further along the discussion but seeing that our meetings are that far apart um, and there's quite a bit to some of these particular introductory items um, it gives the trust a little bit of time to digest everything and come back and do some of their own diligence um, and then we can update the packet as we go along so tonight with us we have Laura from uh, Mass Housing Production or am I saying that acronym right? Mass Housing Partnership. Partnership. Thank you. All right. <laughs> They're interested in production. Yeah, fair enough. Um, she just got a brief presentation. As, um, everybody who um, hasn't been here in the past, um, we were awarded a grant from MHP to help us with the design process for 25 Worcester Street. Um, tonight she has um, a, an update and kind of give us um, a, where they're at in the process and hopefully along the way it can give us some guidance on timelines. So um, I know there's some people in the audience here, there's probably some panelists that are um, concerned with this particular project um, that want to make sure they understand, you know, when significant items will happen um, in the timeline of when we approach and how we approach the RFP. So, Laura, do you, do you need anything more from me before um, I just let you have the floor? Nope. I think I'm I'm ready to go. All right. So I, I'm just going to let her um, give her introduction, and then we'll just hold questions to the end. Oh, there's Lakeisha right there. Okay. Take it away, Laura. Um, thanks. Um, so I'm Laura Schufel from MHP. Um, I'm the director of community assistance, and I've been working, um, started working with the trust a few months ago, um, looking at this property um, to um, get your views on what you want to see there. But also, uh, we we um, commissioned a due diligence report, which I hope you all have. Um, the report, um, you know, basically found that there's um, uh, there's no real constraints to construct to um, development on the site. Um, there's a couple of cautions um, for, um, you know, uh, water depth to water. Um, there's shallow is shallow, um, but that it can usually be um, engineered around and, and couldn't happen until um, you really knew what was going on the site um, to do the the engineering for it. Um, and the same is true for um, stormwater retention. Um, again, it's an engineering kind of equation or calculation that they do, but can't really be done until um, you know what's going to go on there. Um, they do anticipate that there'll be, you know, a stormwater um, retention system um, that it you know won't just be a natural draining because of um, the soils and the high groundwater. Um, so if if anyone has any questions about the due diligence, I'm happy to answer, try and answer them. I'm sure. I... So the, the diligence report um, didn't make the packet. Um, okay. So it will post out, and we'll um, we'll we'll send it back out again. Okay, that's it's that's fine. By and um, large, what everybody has anticipated with the site. Right. It's it's. I, I don't think there was you know any surprises, but it's also it's always prudent to do it before embarking on um, on anything else. Um, so our our consultants are Bowler, um, an engineering firm. They kind of a do broad spectrum from planning to um, all kinds of civil. Um, engineering. So the second phase would be once once we're at a point, you're at a point to look at uh, conceptual site plans. So when we know, you know, um, what your what you would like to see for a number of buildings, um, you know, 
kind of how many units you want, how many buildings, and that kind of fits into if there's any height restrictions. Um, and and then they will do some um, kind of conceptual planning, have a few different con concept plans um, so you could see how um, the development might be situated on the site. And they won't do that until we get input um, on um, on what you know what you want to see or what what you think is the best option there um, you know where access is from um, from the roadway that's part of it and then trying to minimize um, you know parking lots or the you know visualization of, of parking from the road um, that's never doesn't typically um, isn't typically what folks like to see um, so that's a little bit down the road. I'll tell you where that fits in the um, in kind of the timeline. Um, also, back in March, I sent what I call my beginning memo, which has a list of questions um, that um, usually I walk through with um, with trusts or whoever's doing the um, RFP with me and. When we get the answers to those, then we can do a first draft of, of a RFP. Um, some of it, some of it can wait till later, but most of it is um, just helping do the narrative for the RFP, and then it's fine tuned after the after the first couple of drafts, looking at criteria. So what's what is acceptable? What's what's not acceptable, what's acceptable, and what's highly advantageous for any of the categories that you would want to score uh, proposals on. So design, developer experience, affordability, green building, uh, amenities, you know, you can kind of, kind of think of them all in your head now. So that's kind of how um, I structure um, these kinds of technical assistance um, engagements. Um, so I had, and it, I'm sure it didn't get in the packet because um, it came late, but um, after some of our first conversations, um, I went through and, and put what I thought your answers were, um, for what I heard um, for some of the questions, um, just to kind of start the conversation. So when you so I sent that and you should get it for your next meeting um, and it might be a trigger for conversation to see whether you know um, we were on the same page or you had different thoughts or you know um, and there's uh, obviously some that I didn't have any answers to because I didn't know what uh, you were thinking. Um, so that kind of leads us to timeline and next steps. So the next steps would be to answer those questions. And, you know, I'm happy to do it in, in a meeting with you, however you want to do it. Um, I think, you know, they're just, it's important to get those questions answered so that um, I have some understanding of what you're looking for and also so I can relay that to Bowler um, so that we can get some conceptual plans um in the works now it only the getting the conceptual site plans only takes about a month from when i give them directions um to to you getting the drafts and then you'll see them as drafts and you know either thumbs up or thumbs down them and again whatever whatever you you choose or you like um goes all of them go into the RFP, but um, because you can't prescribe what the conceptual site plan should be, but these are, you put in the ones that you think, um, you, you know, are most, most like what, what you'd like to see in there, um, if that makes sense. Um, usually once you have kind of a first draft, you know, obviously with, holes in it um, before you get to real fine tuning the criteria. Um, that's usually where you plug in 
um, community engagement. And um, community engagement can be done either in-house or you can hire consultants to do it. To do it, that's one thing that I don't do because um, um, I'm not very good at it. Um, to be honest with you, um, and I really don't have the time. It's, it's time-consuming on on this side. So, um, and community engagement consultants um, run the gamut of you know really intensive in-person focus group kind of um, engagements. Um, there's some that do a lot of um, online surveys and a web a web page where you can put information. Folks can ask questions. Of course, that means someone has to monitor it to answer the questions. Um, but those, and they put signs around town saying, you know, the project, you know, um, wants to hear from you, go to this, you know, go to this website or scan this uh, Q code. Um, and so anyway, that's kind of the community engagement that can, and they all, they all have either virtual or in-person, um, you know, kind of question and answer kind of things. Um, and so then of course, after the, the, well, during the community engagement, while that's happening, you fine tuning the RFP. How much time does all of that take? It's really dependent on how uh, robust or or time consuming your community engagement is. Um, but this, from now to having a final RFP, could be anywhere from three months to six months. That's probably, and, and that really is dependent on on how many edits we do and. Um, whether you want design guidelines, I didn't kind of put that in the timeline, but if you want some kind of design guidelines, they have to be very broad. Um, but, you know, we can, we can do something um, or you can just leave it pretty much not wide open, but, um, you know, it has to be a Grafton vernacular, it has to look like it fits in the, um, in the town center or, you know, pick something um, where you want it. You don't want to see steel and glass, or you don't want to see brick, or you don't want to see something. You want to have exteriors that, um, you know, materials that are traditional or or you want something totally different. Um, so you can kind of put those kind of parameters in the, in the narrative of the RFP, or you can do it in some um, external um attachment that's uh that are guidelines i'm happy to share um rfps that i've done in the past and what proposals were came back so you can see kind of this is these people had guidelines that said this and this is what we got these people didn't have any just had broad and these are the kinds of things that, that came through if that's helpful, um, everything's public and it um, usually helps people visualize um, what, you know, what's gonna come back depending on what you say in the proposal. Laura, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a quick question or actually a couple quick questions for you if that's okay. Yeah, of course. All right, so this is, I, I think, generally speaking where this trust historically speaking has fallen down in pursuit of creating units we get to a mm -hmm. point where someone has to decide how many units are going where obviously um not just this neighborhood but any neighborhood you build in the pushback is going to be fewer units and mm -hmm. with trust resources being limited it's been my understanding over the years that the fewer units that there are mobilization costs and construction costs being what they are, um, the more subsidy it, it takes from an affordable housing trust to be able to, to create a project so that, you know, larger developments are a little bit more, uh, developers have more of an appetite for those than they were for, for smaller. So when, when someone comes to us and says, well, how many units do you want to go in 2.3 acres? 
my response is generally, well, however many it takes to get a developer to bite, but not too, too much more than that, because obviously you're going to get so much pushback from the community that the project is a non-starter. So how do you, mm -hmm. how do we square that circle from, from where we are right now? So two things will impact that. It's, um, well, a few things, a few factors. Number one, it's on sewer, so that's very helpful because they're not paying for septic or a wastewater treatment plant. So we can take that off the off the table for costs. Um, also, you know, the, the best source of funds for a developer are low-income housing tax credits. And um, there are whether no matter how many units in a development for tax credits, um, there are fixed costs. So there's kind of a minimum of how many it makes sense and how many would attract a developer. And that number's somewhere around 30. Um, now, low income housing tax credits, the income limit is 60% AMI. So some some communities will want to have something, some units that are a little higher than that. Um, and so they'll maybe do 35 units or they'll do 35 units and 28 are tax credits because you can kind of make that work. Um, so I think you're looking, you know, that's that's kind of what I say is, is kind of a, a, um, a minimum is somewhere in the, you know, somewhere around 30. Okay. Um, below that, there's really um, not a lot of subsidy. There's a community scale program that goes up to 20 units. Um, but there's really not a lot of, uh, it doesn't fill the gap. So there has to be um, greater local, there has to be a lot of local funds to make that one work. Um, and and other than that, there's a lot of sources at DHCD that they just, you know, you you ask for so much money and they pick which bucket it's from. But the the soft money that they have is no matter which bucket you take it from or how many buckets you take it from, it's um, you know a hundred thousand a unit. Mm -hmm. Tax credits are like two seventy five a unit, and you can get the hundred. So you can get like 375 a unit. You just can't, you know, it just makes the projects work. That's that's similar to what we've experienced in other developments, the, the 100 figure you just said. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of where you are. Can you can you go a little lower than um, than 30 yet? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on what you're doing. Um, I. I just um, did a project in Gloucester um, that was supportive, frail elderly, um, and one proposal came in at 28, I think, and the other one came in at 20. They're obviously not using tax credits, they're using supportive housing money. And 20 is about the highest you can do for that. Um, and that's again, they have, Gloucester has a lot of CPA money they can put into it. So that so. actually leads me to the next question. Thank you for, for conveniently going there. Um, if it's not the tax credits, talk to me about the su supportive housing money. Where is that coming from? The supportive housing money is a separate round of funding that DHCD does, and it's actually paid for by the National Affordable Housing Trust, which you know, I don't know how long it's been now. It seems like it was just yesterday, but it's a, um, a affordable housing trust that was set up. Um, and I can't, now I'm forgetting where, where, how it's funded, but it doesn't really matter. It's federal funds that the state distributes. Um, it also comes with supportive service money. So it comes with wraparound services. Okay. Um, Sometimes, you know, it can be for, a lot of different populations, but it's for special populations. So fair to say then that for the, the, if you're starting to dip below 30 units, the more you're dipping below that, the more you're trying to reach into these either supportive housing funds or CPA money to 
cover that nut to lure a developer in to be able to do something like this. Yeah. Okay. And there's there are funds that you can put up to 15% of the units as this um, community-based housing, and um, that those funds pay 50% of the total development cost of that unit, and it comes with a voucher. So, but you can only do 15%, but those are for um, special populations again. So, but you can put them in a, in a, you know, regular. So the whole, the whole development doesn't have to be supportive. You can have individual units that are, are a number of them. Okay. So there's more than one way to skin it, but you're going to be around the 30 number in pretty much every, every avenue you take. Unless, again, unless you're doing supportive and, and, uh, and then you can do somewhere 20 to 24 or something, I think is, is the number of that. So I guess, I guess then before we, when we're answering these questions for you, what we're going to have to decide, one of the big questions is going to be, are we pursuing a frail, frail elderly development, which would get us supportive housing money? Um, or are we pursuing just a, a 55 plus development? So Gloucester let it let left it open. Okay. Um, they said we want it. You know, it's got to be seniors. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of like it to be supportive or have some supportive units, but we also kind of want to maximize. But when it came down to to um, looking at where their gaps were in need for need in their community, it was um, in affordable kind of frail um and so they went with the 20 units versus the 28 because okay. the 28 didn't have supportive services in the um the rp process for gloucester how many um people answered the bid just two they basically had two projects to choose from one frail one not yeah and that that had a lot to do with a number of things first of all gloucester it's not easy there's not a lot of um nonprofits or others in the area that would be interested in it um and the site is a little tough so laura that's one of the things that concerns me is i wonder how easy it's going to be to get a developer to do what we're we want them to do what happens if it comes back and there's there's no bids on it and are we back to the drawing board yeah okay yeah um that would be a first for me. So um, there, there are developers who um, specifically do senior housing in the whole gamut from independent living to, you know, um, fully supportive um, and, and the continuums and everything in between. And so it's, it's making sure they're aware of the RFP um, and and then also looking to your um, nonprofits in the areas that um, may be interested in doing it. I, I know you're going to send along the Gloucester RFP to us um, and we'll put it in a future packet. But how large was that parcel? And you said it was a difficult parcel. It is a difficult parcel. The the land area, if you if you took out, if you just looked at it on a map with no topo. Um, I think was two acres, a little bit more. Um, but I think there was 1.6 that was developable because the rest of it was like a 40 foot wall in the back. So um, it was, it was, and there was this um, sewer line that wasn't quite on the board, that was inside the border, 25 feet or something like that. So that made the, made the site even smaller. So um, right, does anybody, it might have been a bit less than 1.6. Anybody in the panelists, Dan, Lakeisha, or Brittany, have some questions for uh, Laura? Uh, just a, a quick uh, thing for uh, Chris. Uh, Eric Swenson is joined, but he is an attendee. He needs to be promoted. Is this yeah, kind of RFP the one that was sent to us originally a few months ago? I think it was a Gloucester one. Yes. 
Yeah, I thought I had sent it. Yeah, you did. Okay. So there's a couple more pieces that are coming along that didn't make this packet that we'll put in. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, um, did you have some, any questions for Laura? Did you get a chance to see any of the uh, presentation? Yeah, I, I just popped in a couple minutes ago. Okay. No worries, though. I'll just rewatch it. Yep. Uh, you can send any questions directly to her. Um, you should have her email because I think I forwarded it to everybody. Um, okay. So next steps for what we want to see. So if that material we didn't get in the packet, I guess I would recommend seeing that the timetable was so long for this that um, we not waste any more time. Um, so I'm going to send that along and then let everybody wrap their heads around it. And then we'll have a meeting in say two weeks specific to this particular project and just spend a half hour, 45 minutes kind of hashing out everything. Um, of course it will be open to the public. Laura, you, you know, you, you can go if you want, if, if not, um, it will probably be a Thursday night at 7:45, similar to this one. Um, but we should expect to solicit for some public comment as well. Just, it's been a long time since, um, we've kind of, kind of come full circle on this project, you know, going to look at a whole bunch of new concepts. Um, there's people in our meeting every single month, um, that are highly interested in this particular parcel. So we'll move quickly, um, and try to get the RFP to a point where we can, um, you know, kind of make it readily available to everybody and then just get it on its way. Yep. Um, so expect a meeting in a, in a couple weeks um, and then I will forward everything along um, in that meeting packet that um, that will bring everybody up to date. So independent trust members um, just engage with Laura directly um, with responses or questions and Laura I hope you don't mind fielding it from you know six or seven different directions but there's no way to kind of do that in the you know through email without yeah. us, um, you know, yeah. kind of being a foul of um, open meeting law. Yeah. Um, and then we'll rally up and then we'll take this to the next step and, and get it moving. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Laura before we can let her go? Okay. Thank you very much, Laura, for coming. Oh, you're welcome. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Okay. Thanks. So everybody who's here kind of grasp that it's a, it's kind of a lengthy process. And if you've heard it before, I understand. I'm just, if, if you're new um, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not familiar with everybody in the, um, uh, the attendees. Um, but this project has been going on for a while. And just from, from a historical perspective, we did a couple iterations when we first looked at it. And this was all two know, years ago. Yeah, a while back. Um, and then we didn't quite make any headway with it. So um, Ed reached out to MHP and we applied for a grant. We were given it. MHP is kind of stepping in um, and they have a lot more understanding um, about how this process happens and the, the particular type of housing that we're looking to put there. Um, so it worked out very well, um, but it's um, you know a cumbersome process. We only meet a certain schedule. They only have a certain amount of time to allocate to us. Um, so it would behoove us to get it to the next point quickly. Um, but I know there's some patient, patience issues out there, but um, this is kind of the, the bureaucratic process that we're going through. So we're outsourcing it. It's a little bit more professionally handled, um, and their access to the networks is far greater than we would get on our own. So the quality of what we're proposing should be, of, um, should be greater. Um, that being said, that's pretty much all we have for 25 Worcester Street tonight. So I know people are specifically here for that. Um, we'll send everything out and advertise for the next meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, and then feel free, uh, hearing what you heard tonight, or if you review it at home, to send um, any comments or concerns or something that you want to see at that particular meeting. Um, just send it along directly to the planning office. It will come back to me. And, and then we'll make sure that gets kind of filtered back through. Um, in case anybody doesn't want to stand up in front of an audience, that's a, a good way to do it as well. Just send your questions to me and I'll make sure I, I incorporate them into the presentation. Um, Joyce, real quick, we're going to move to the next thing, but... Do you have a copy of the Gloucester plans you received from her three months or so ago? Yeah. Publicly? 
Yeah, I'll rewrap that all up, and then whatever she's okay. sending it to us on the um, the Gloucester ends. There's some additional questions that she sent back to us, and there was also kind of like a narrative, um, kind of outlining the timeline of what she had presented today. All that will make it into the next packet for in two weeks, so you'll see it online and be able to go through it all. Um, I'll try to get that actually done. Um, uh, tomorrow my work schedule is pretty hectic, but I'll try to get it posted by next Tuesday. So you'll have an opportunity next week to kind of review it and that everybody can get back to me. That's trust members included. Um, okay. Well, moving on. We have another presentation tonight. This is on a writer first refusal. Um, for 173 and 183 Upton Street to familiarize yourself with that location it's right down by Silver Lake um, kind of the tail end of Upton Street before it um, you move into Upton yeah Chris if you could uh, put that map up on the screen the page 5 of the packet I think that uh, I'll, I'll basically just talk from that and uh, as soon as we get the map on display. Okay, just to introduce yourself and uh, let everybody know your expertise on this particular project. Yep. Yes, while Chris is getting the map up. Um, for, for those who may not know me, I'm Dave Robbins. I'm a member of the planning board. And uh, if we could turn that map, you know, ro rotate that map so the writing is more easily readable. There we go. And the uh, so uh, just just to uh, to to explain better where we are, I'll, I'll put this you know put this in in context in terms of where in Grafton we're talking about. Then I'll explain why we're here. Uh, you know, the upper right hand corner of that map is Cider Mill Pond. The lower right hand corner is Silver Lake. The road running down from top to bottom is Route 140 Upton Street. And along the top of those yellow shaded lots is Stowe Road. So the, 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 lot, the lots in question that are being withdrawn from Chapter 61B are the, the ones shaded in green are the two lots that we're going to be talking about. Um, the, uh, the, the owner of the lots the, has you know, notified the town that they plan to withdraw them from Chapter 61B gives the town 120 days to exercise the right of first refusal to purchase the lots. Uh, I don't remember the exact dates, but I believe the 120 days uh, yeah, expires in September sometime. I don't have the exact date. Uh, but you know, to, for a little bit more context, the lots shaded in yellow just above the green lots are four lots that the town acquired via a Chapter 61B withdrawal three years ago. We bought those in 2019 with uh, community preservation funds. Uh, they're now under a conservation restriction. Uh, the lot below, the ones shaded in blue, are the remaining land of the Robinsons that is not currently, you know, it's still under Chapter 61B and it's going to remain so for the, you know, at least the near-term foreseeable future. Uh, what's interesting about these, norm, uh, the the reason the town would be interested in acquiring these lands is because they, uh, it helps to complete the town's protection of all the land around Misco Brook, Cider Mill Pond, and Silver Lake. Now, we discussed this in a planning board meeting back on the 23rd of May, where the planning board was asked to make a recommendation to the select board regarding whether the town should exercise its option to acquire these lots. And the idea that Chris brought to the board, and we discussed it for a little while, and the board thought it'd be worthwhile following up on the idea, is because the lots shaded the, the, in orange to the left across the road, uh, there is an existing multifamily development, specifically at 16 condo units that were you know, developed starting around 1988. And the, uh, the proximity of this land just across the street from there suggests maybe it's worth considering building some housing and we're bringing this to the attention of the trust because the idea was maybe some affordable housing on the front portion of those green lots near 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 the road uh, so that was the essential idea that the board said yeah that sounds like it's worth uh, worth following up on 
Uh, the, so we bring this to the trust tonight for your consideration as to the possibility whether whether the trust would be interested in uh, you know, pursuing that idea. And a couple of thoughts that popped into my head after I wrote the memo and submitted the material for your packet is a couple of thoughts that are worth keeping in mind, I think. One is that if you look at these two lots, the, the lot lines you know, don't necessarily look really conducive to building some housing in the front part of the lots. Uh, that's, at least in my mind, that's not a major obstacle. One could easily redraw the lot and simply merge the two lots or divide them into two lots front and back in some way. The idea that we discussed was you know, protecting and preserving the back end, back side of the lots uh, through whatever means, if there are several possible means, uh, uh, that would, among other things, help to you know, provide some connection from the yellow shaded lots above to the blue shaded lots that may eventually be acquired. Uh, the other thought uh, that popped into my head was the question of how do we, you know, what money do does the town use to acquire these lots? You know, typically, we acquire this by you know, using CPA funds. And if we were to use CPA funds to fully fund the cost of acquiring these lots, that brings with it a restriction of in terms of the kinds of housing that we could build if we so chose. The CPA funds cannot be used to fund uh, you know, the market rate housing. Mm -hmm. So if CPA funds were used to buy this land, the housing built on the land would have to be within the CPA parameters, which is affordable for 100% AMI or less. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to note the difference between that and the qualification for SHI, which is 80% AMI or less. Mm -hmm. So we could, in principle, if we use CPA funds to buy the land, we could build some 100% AMI housing and some 80% and, and below. Uh, but that does tend to constrain somewhat what the trust could consider doing. On the other hand, if one were to use non-CPA funds, say funds from the Pulte settlement or just general town capital funds to acquire a portion of the property, the portion upon which housing would be built, then there would be more flexibility. So if we wanted to pursue this idea, we'd have to think through for, well, first of all, whether the trust is interested at all, and that's you know the, the the main question for tonight. But if the trust is interested, then one would have to you know think through how best to acquire you know to to fund the, the land purchase. So that's you know in, in brief, that's kind of where we were at, where we were coming from, and why we're here. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Chris. Chris, you got to take yourself off mute. Thank you. My space bar didn't work while I was <laughs> in the document. Um, no, thank you. I think that summed it up really well um, and went over the, the details and discussion that we had at the planning board level. So, Chris, do me a favor. Just you. introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Christopher McGoldrick. I'm the town planner. Thank you. What would be the acquisition cost? I, I thought I saw a number in here, but I can't find If it. I remember correctly, the dollar amount is, is it 300,000 or 600, 300 per lot or for a total of 600 or 300 total? I don't remember. I believe it was 300 per lot um, for a total of 600,000. Uh, I don't remember specifically the number. And that's but. a market for those two lots? Yep, that's, that's the purchase and sale agreement they have for those two lots. Yeah, but if it's over market, we're allowed to go and, and, and look at it. Yeah, I will say that it's not based off of the PNS. It's based off of uh, um, some type of appraisal between the two parties. I thought. Yeah. Nor nor normally, we have to meet the PNS price. We can we can dispute that with an with an alternative appraisal. Uh, the one case that I can remember that we did dispute the PNS price, we lost. We, 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 we obtained an, a, a, an appraisal. I'm, I'm going back many, many years with that, but we obtained an appraisal that was much lower. And, you know, we, we, we tried to assert that and ultimately failed. I mean, that's an expensive lot. Yeah. 300K, in the conditions that you're at down there, there's no public infrastructure. So your, you know, septic system, well, everything's kind of there. Yeah. I mean that bodes well for you know other people with naked land in town. But <laughs> my word, <laughs> that's got to be a good seventy-five k over what I've seen 
lots of, you know, going in town substantially more. Yeah, for what it's worth, these lots are both approximately two acres in size. Yeah. But generally speaking, the size of the, of the lot is not a major factor in the, the appraisal. Yeah, there's not enough frontage there to split them into two. So, yeah, and these, yeah, as as it stands, these two lots are in a two acre zoning and uh, you know, an 80,000 square foot minimum lot size. Yeah. So these two lots with the lot size and the frontage qualify as you know, exactly two building lots. Yeah, so anything you, we would deviate would be you know, kind of like that self-funded lip process, um, similar to what yeah. we're going to engage with with 25 Wister yeah. Street. Yeah, anything anything the trust would be interested in doing this, you know, on this would clearly be a, a comprehensive permit. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing, Chris and Dave, um, and I'm not aware of it, but you know, we talked about this a little bit when I was on the select board when we were looking to exercise our right of first refusal for the um, orchard on Creeper Hill that we didn't end up getting. But in that dialogue, um, the town giving its ability to exercise um, to other um, organizations in town is limited. So while we can participate in the funding source, I, I didn't think the town was able to grant us the authority to step in um, as an institution and um, buy it for ourselves. That's what I was told then. Um, I don't know if that's changed, so it would have to be some partnership or some, you know, the logistics of it would be cumbersome. So we would have to say, yeah, we want it for this. The select board would have to say, yes, we're willing to go to town meeting to appropriate the funding, and then we would have to reimburse the town through some mechanic. Or the, the town would purchase it and just gift it to us in a separate exchange, which yeah. I would prefer. I mean, <laughs> look. It's three hundred thousand dollars for two lots. I mean, so it's six hundred thousand dollars total. We are in the really unique position that we've never been in before, where we've got so much going on. Where now we've got a budget because we were the GSX layout is enormous. Um, I don't know what CPC is going to get back to us on that. And, and there's, there was a proposal floated, and then we've got twenty five Worcester. We're not sure. You know, is that conversation just laid out? We're not sure exactly what our um, subsidy would be for that. Um, to make the the unit count palatable for everybody, so I don't I don't know. I mean, we I don't think we can commit six hundred thousand dollars, but that's just me. I don't know. How much of it is even buildable? Is question. it wetlands in the back? I I don't know. Um, I'm not, I, yeah, I have no information on that. I think generally speaking, it's probably at least the front portions of the lots are likely buildable. Um, I'd, I'd like to see some survey or something yeah. before we even. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah I mean, the there's, too, you know, Brittany, where you're going to be under the time constraint to actually get that accomplished. Yep. Um, and I mean, just nothing for nothing, but even when I was on CPC, you know, almost 15 years ago now, um, as the, the Robinson land, as it was coming out of chapter was always on the to-do list for open space yep. and acquisition. Um, and they also funded those four lots that came off a few years ago. Yes. I know there's an appetite there to take it and conserve it. Yeah, um, I think it, it seems likely to me, and I'll, I'll, the, the decision is ultimately up to the select board, but it, it seems like the pretty much the unanimous recommendations that the select board have been receiving from various boards has been for the town to exercise the option. Sure. So it's likely that the town will be acquiring this land the question is whether it's within the realm of feasibility and interest for the trust to consider getting involved in that. And and I don't know. I mean, it's you know, as you said, you guys you guys have a number of other projects on your plate, and th this may be something that looks like a neat idea, but may not be practical. Well, so i i think that just partially answered my question if the tr if the town is considering acquiring this anyway either for open space or housing you know open space is going to get it for free like that it's going to be yeah. conserved land right so then fine if the town wants to go ahead and acquire it yeah from uh, sign me up sure we'll do our due diligence and if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out it's the same way i feel about every project like if it We'll kick the tires if if it can, we can't put something there. Then I guess we won't. 
but there's no harm in saying, okay, here's additional land that we could look into for housing. Yeah, so that, that you know, with, you, with, with sort of going in that direction, the, the, th the thing that we have to work out is you know, if we want to keep the option open for the trust to do something here, we have to think very carefully about how we fund this, right. how the town funds the purchase so as right. to not overly constrain the trust. Now, if the trust, if the trust would be comfortable building, finding a way to, uh, or attempting to uh, uh, pursue a project that will be entirely 100% AMI or less, than just a straight use of CPA funds, which is probably what's going to happen in any, you know, by default. Mm -hmm. But uh, other other than that, if we want to follow up, we may want to, uh, over time, think about you know how best to fund it. Chris, you had some thought process on um, how many units you could put there and what you were thinking about when you uh, chased down this rabbit hole. You're on mute again, pal. Yeah. No, sorry. It was. Uh... You know, I, I didn't really think unit count. I was just thinking in terms of um, potential to put some units on there, um, as well as um, preserve open space and kind of a, the duality of that. I think there was there was option there. Um, I did look back at the uh, RFP quick, or not the RFP, but the 61A filing quick, um, and actually the total purchase price is 300, so it's 150 per per lot. Oh, good. Uh, I just wanted, much better. Just wanted to clarify that. So. Yeah, I knew. I remembered the figure three hundred, and I wasn't sure exactly what what it applied to. But that's that's good to know. So, from our perspective, if we were to engage the select board, which we're going to have to provide some type of feedback to them um, in a letter, which is what we need to make sure we do tonight, so they can get it for their next meeting as well, because um, the clock is ticking on this. Is there would be some type of A and R that we would have to complete. And we basically take the frontage and you know a certain amount of depth, and the goal there would be if we were to, to pair funds with somebody else that we would get that deeded to us, similar to 25 Worcester Street, which is another action that needs to happen separate from the acquisition at town meeting, and then on that land um, we would go through our process of seeing what we could develop there. Um, so there's, there'd be a couple steps there. Um, there is a viable project, of course, right across the street because it's been there for over 30 years. Um, and you would think something similar. So it would be a shared septic system, um, you know, costly systems at that, but um, not that much greater than $5,000 per unit to hook up to sewer as it stands now and an additional 3500 to hook up to water. Yeah. So you're not outside the realm of possibility for a developer to look at six units there and say, oh, yeah, this, this may work. Dan has two hands up, one on the screen and one other thing. Oh, unfortunately, Dan, <laughs> I could not see you. I apologize. Yeah, the, least... the hand up here, or may, I don't know, maybe you've seen over here, but yeah, uh, it kind of blends in. Anyway, uh, so the a, a couple questions. With, um, with CPC funds or CPA funds, just to be clear, if we use CPA funds, every single unit has to be 100% AMI or less, not 25%. Correct. Is that correct? Right, the CPA funds, when, when CPA funds are used for community housing, which is the, the CPA term for it, that the 100% uh, of the CPA funds must be used for housing that's uh, affordable for 100% AMI or less. Now, a way that can often play out, not, not applicable here, but a way that can often play out is CPA funds might pay for, say, 50% of the cost of a project. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 building right. cost in which case 50 percent of the project would have to be 100 percent ami or less uh, when Got cpa it. funds are buying the land if cpa funds are buying 100 percent of the land for the project then the entire project has to be 100 percent ami or less okay at least uh, as i as i understand the cpa rules right so and then uh so if we the trust doesn't go for this. Uh, I think I heard it mentioned that the town is thinking about buying it anyway. Is that, did yes. I hear that right? Thinking about proposing. So proposing. The select board has to initiate the right of first refusal. Then, yes. then right. spending on it will go to town meeting. 
Okay. So, and then there'd have to be a special town meeting to get this before the September deadline, right? I believe the September deadline is for the selectmen to notify the applicant that the town oh, okay. to exercise. So, you know, the, the actual, you know, funding action can take place at the uh, October town meeting. Yeah. It, oh, that's convenient. <laughs> there, there are two different clocks on it. So after you're, you clock that the, you're going to exercise it, then you have a certain amount of time. And I don't remember or re recall what that time is, but you would have time to go to September town meeting. You probably would not have time to go to September town meeting. And then if it failed to come back and do another funding mechanism in spring. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and then, do we know anything about uh, who is buying if we don't? Uh, or I, I would imagine you typically don't know much about that, but I'm just curious. Yes. the Like uh, is a developer, you know. The purchase and sale agreement does identify the buyer. Okay. And so would they, would we expect this to be like uh, a 40B or a LIP uh, if the town doesn't go for it? So I mean, there is a potential for whoever purchases it to do anything. The, I mean, the builder is Scion Builders, S Y O N Builders LLC, from Cherry Valley, Massachusetts. So I assume yeah. it's a developer. Yes, it it uh, yeah, it. Th this says nothing about the intent, what what the buyer intends to right. build on there, but it it is a builder. Right. Right. So one one so, can assume that as a minimum. Two single-family homes will be built, one on each lot. Right. You know, one one could have one could speculate that the buyer may intend to you know, you know, build something more than that through a comprehensive permit. And I guess that's my question: is is there a um, is there enough frontage as we were looking at those lots to, for just the standard one-acre lots? Yes. Okay. Yes, the lots. The lots were divided approximately one year ago. There, there were the what is now the four lots that I showed on the plan. The ones highlighted in green and blue were formerly two lots, uh, and they were re redivided through an approval not required plan approximately one year ago into the four lots that you see now. Okay. And a prerequisite for that is that each of the lots so divided has the minimum required frontage at least thank you yeah, the straightforward build is just two single family homes um does anybody else have any questions for david or chris on this matter um could you one of you scroll down the attendees make sure there's not a hand up in there uh, there's nothing in there okay thank you um why don't we go around and um dan starting with you just kind of collect um, some opinions on this? Uh, I'm, I'm interested. I think, uh, like Brittany said, I want to see a little bit more information about uh, how much and, you know, which parts are buildable. Um, I think I'd like to, to know a little bit more about what um, the idea is with splitting it, like with that is the idea that it would just come out of, you know, a little bit of affordable housing CPA funds and a little bit of conservation CPA funds, uh, kind of hear a little bit more if, um, because it, uh, it sounds like somebody had an idea for that uh, and kind of just like to hear like the, the rest of the idea. Um, and then, uh, yeah, interested in hearing more. Brittany. Do you know what zone it's in? Is it the same as across the street or? Yeah, uh, actually, I think the the zone that this is in, I think when I looked at it the other day, the zone line kind of runs right down the middle of 140, but the zone on this side, the zone is at, it's what we call the agricultural zone, which is uh, mm -hmm. two acre minimum lot size. Across the street, it might be the R40, I don't remember for sure. So it, it should be R40 the rest of the way up. And then it turns into um, what you get, you know, as you get closer to the common. I don't know where the delineation is. We can pull it up if you want, Brittany. That's okay. I can look it up. All right. Just trying to see. A is the one that kind of goes down. It's basically the entire eastern side, you know, east mm -hmm. sub east side of right down to the flea market. Interesting enough, the flea market's in agriculture. 
also has a liquor license yes yeah. as well in agricultural Interesting yeah i, I just double checked the uh, uh, across the street is indeed uh, the uh, r40 okay. Save the shanty. yeah yeah a good argument for a variance if one. yeah anything you do Brittany, is anything beyond just a single family is going to be um a variance process just trying to see the the barriers ahead of us but well except for yeah yeah a lot <laughs> yeah relatively high um and uh, I'll, I'll wait and weigh in at the end eric do you have anything yeah um i mean I, i'm kind of in you know what ed said like i don't want to say anything until i know more about this but it does seem like a lot of complexity um to make this happen i mean that that purchase price is a lot of money for empty lots so um you know that said though if we can make something happen great um you know just based on the other projects we've seen um those seem more attractive to me but you know timing is everything so um, my philosophy on land acquisition for the trust is the same as Bill Belichick's philosophy on um, draft pick acquisition. The more you have, the more opportunity you have to turn out something that's actually good because so many times we kick the tires on something historically on this trust and it just doesn't work out and you have to move in a different direction. But we can't do anything first without land. And that's sort of the name of the game. So yeah, I'm, I'm interested. Let's see what we can do with the land. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll throw our hat in the ring. Again, if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, so from guidance from perspective of the trust, the trust is going to have to put together a kind of a letter just like other departments did. We'll send it back to the select board, um, and they'll review everything. Ultimately, it's their decision whether to pull the trigger on the right of first refusal anyways. Um, as they set it up, of course, they, they only have a couple of meetings before they have to make a decision anyways. So I guess if, if I'm sensing the direction of it, um, do you want me to, to kind of format something and then send it along this way that, you know, something that kind of says, we have a few more questions. Um, we are, of course, interested in anything, um, any land acquisition, um, but we need uh, a little bit more time to put our thoughts around what could actually happen there. Um, and we also need some guidance from the select board, on, you know, how far they'd be willing to go. Now, one caveat to this is um, this is a town meeting action. Um, there are going to be um, a considerable amount of um, what I would say is political force at um, the town meeting um, looking to acquire this property. Um, it's something that's been on the radar for years. It's something that's kind of been entrenched in the mindset of gathering um, open space around Silver Lake. Um, something, you know, that I supported at town meetings in the past as well. Um, so I get what they're doing. So there's a lot to navigate there. And um, I just want to caution that as we're getting into a bunch of projects and we're opening up a lot of different cans of worms that um, although I, you know, land acquisition is great, um, I think there's other land in town that um, we might want to, you know, put into this conversation now as opposed to later, um, just to, if we're going to start horse trading, um, you know. Because there's pieces of property that have been sitting doing nothing for, you know, five decades um, with absolutely no plan in place for them that are considerably more appealing than this. Um, so, you know, I would just say if we, we, we take a dive at this in the current political climate, which we all have to be realistic about, um, and then we come back, the, you know, six months later and say, well, we want this one too. Um, perhaps we have all those discussions now, and instead of pissing off everybody in town, we piss off the select few that we've already pissed off, um, and then perhaps <laughs> coalesce around the people that like some of our ideas, and perhaps get one of those other parcels that's being underused and is currently in our town's portfolio. See, that's antithetical to my goal, because I'm here to piss everybody off, yeah. clearly. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, that doesn't... <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be selective about that, right, Ed? <laughs> um, I, I hear no. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I, I, I think the, the I think the issue is um, it, it's hard to know what's gonna what's gonna pop up a few months from now, yeah. right? I mean, because there are known knowns. We we know the parcels that are out there that the town owns in particular that we could take a stab at. 
there are known unknowns. We can identify parcels that we think are going to come up and, you know, areas, farmland that might come up for sale. And then there are unknown unknowns. Like, I didn't know about this. I was on the board when we acquired the uh, the, the parcels back in 2019. And, and Bruce is right. Like, the, the idea was to go around the lake and say, okay, you know, we want to maintain this um, as wooded area. As someone who's advocating for affordable housing, what I know is, there's a need and there's land available and that helps us. But, you know, I'm, a, I have an open mind about it. So whatever you guys want to do. Okay. Either way, I got to get some comments back to them. So I'll put it together. I'll send it to everybody. Um, and if we're going to meet in two weeks, I think that should be sufficient amount of time to draft something and then send it to them. Um, unless you guys just want me to send something, um, via Amber to, uh, to the select board now as a placeholder. Yeah, I think you can be highly confident that if nothing else happens, this land will be purchased using CPA funds. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I we've, mean, we've talked about what that what that does to any thoughts of housing. Yeah. I mean, conceivably, what if you take a first glance at it, um, you know, if you're carving off all the back piece of it as conservation land, you're looking at the front, which is going to be 25 something thousand square feet of space, um, of which, you know, you can probably tie up an additional 30% of it, and then another maybe 20% of it in, in parking. So, I mean, you, you could put a sizable, you know, chunk of units there, so to speak. Yeah, just. Just um, roughly speaking, if it was for a total of four acres here, if you kind of split that in half, you got a yeah. couple acres on the uh, on the front for some housing, a couple acres in the back for you know, protected open space. This is not the hill I want to die on. <laughs> Sorry. Was, did Dan say that a a construction person is or developed? We missed the last part. I think you just want to mute. Oh, sorry. Is the developer selling it? Who's selling it? It's, it's part of the Robinson Trust. So Lee Robinson's family owns a whole okay. swath of land there. Um, we just have the LLC that's part of the PNS, so there's no individual people on it. But, you know, anybody with 500 bucks can incorporate an LLC um, yeah. and submit that so they can have some degree of um, anonymity. Um, okay. Well, David, thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. Of course, Chris is stuck with us the rest of the time. Dave, you want to hang out for no, I'll, a little bit too? I'll, I'll hang out for the rest of the meeting. Just okay. Probably not to make a nuisance of myself, however. Okay. So we won't have a vote on anything in particular to this tonight. I'll get something drafted, get it to everybody for the next meeting, and it will be just one side item. I know I said I wanted to do just one thing at the next meeting, but this seems like a pretty, uh, pretty easy lift, so to speak. Okay, uh, the next piece we have um, tonight is um, we need to initiate the housing production plan. So we got to start in a couple of months any, regardless. So we, um, this is a very important one for us because we get the, the new census data. So Chris is going to help us put together the, um, the RFP to go out and solicit for us. Um, We'll make some inroads with um, the woman who did the last housing production plan, which I thought was very comprehensive. Um, but what we need to do is make sure we coalesce more or less around an idea of um, what we want beyond what we have to put in the housing production plan. So what I'd like tonight is us to just have a, a quick conversation about how we want it to look and how much broader we want the scope to be. Um, it's a it's kind of a weird position because there's a lot of talk about master plans and things of like that nature housing production plan is kind of a separate thing which we're statutorily required to to do um so we go through that process but incorporated in that housing production plan is a lot of essential information for deciding what the town wants to do as far as um grand scheme so to speak you know the things that you want to see in a master plan so if a master plan process takes years to develop, which it does, um, and typically the thing ends up on somebody's, you know, desk somewhere, um, you know, we can kind of incorporate some of the um, things that people want to see and have answers to inside this document 
um, and seeing that we're paying for it anyways, we, it's, it's a very efficient way to spend that money. Um, so, you know, one of our or kind of a discussion items is incorporating the ZBA and the planning board in this particular discussion and, and probably by default the, um, the select board as well. Um, we do have representation on the select board, but we do not on the other boards. Um, so I want to get everybody's thoughts on it. I don't know how familiar everybody is with our current housing production plan, um, but if you've read it, it's a, it's a good document to kind of get a, a good feel about what's needed in town um, and what's been done in town already. Um, and I think um, we're going to pass around another couple of presentations that didn't make this packet as well um, that kind of show the history of how development has gone over the past 30 years in town. Um, and nobody's going to be surprised that 99% of it is single family houses. Um, you don't really have to throw a stone without knowing that. But um, I'm just going to open it up real quick. Um, just chime in as you see fit. Um, I can't see a lot of the hands, but um, you don't need me to call on you. Or if you do, Dan, you start. So what, what exactly are we commenting on right now? I want your input on, on a direction for the housing production plan. So we, we've got to start on it. Um, I want your yeah, ideas I, for. I, I'm not. I don't really know what you mean by direction on that. Things you'd like to see in it beyond what's in our current housing production plan. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess I really haven't thought much about that. Um, I've I've read the current housing production plan. I didn't really. I didn't realize there was. We could ask for other things. So I'd have to kind of think about that a little bit, or, or hear ideas of you know, the types of things that you could include in there. Okay. Is that going to be the general consensus? Is you, you kind of want to know what our range is? Yeah. Has anyone redone theirs that we think is a good example recently? So I've not seen a current one. Yeah. I mean, I'll I'll tell you. Um, you know, Karen Sonnenborg does ours. She does a good job. Um, I was on the trust back in 2012 when we I think when we had one done, and and then we had one done again. I think when I was on the select board. Because I think they get to do them every four years, and you know, obviously, the main purpose of getting them done is is to provide a roadmap and and a snapshot in time of where you are on housing production, where you need to be, and you know, if you've read this one, there are like goals in there and land you can acquire. But if I'm being candid, I've never found it other than the data. The data is crucial, I think, because it's all based on census data and and stuff that they they um, compile for us, but the plan part of it is pie in the sky stuff. You know, we've never, I, I've never been to a trust meeting where we pulled out the housing production plan and been like, okay, here's what's next on the plan, let's do that. Um, and I don't know that that's really sort of part of it because I, I, again, it, to be candid, you'll pay for the housing production plan, it's gonna look exactly like the one you have now the words are going to be the same as the one you have now karen's going to go in and she's going to fill in the blanks on the update on the data you know what's your demographics like who are the people in town how many affordable units do you have how many single family units do you have how many rental units do you have all that stuff and although this stuff changes with time um you, you know the the actual i if i could change anything about it i think i would want a more interactive plan part but that might be a little far afield from what she offers you know what i mean so i'm not sure how much further we can go plus we don't get the that second data purpose. before we do the plan part well the second purpose for it is you have to do it in order to have the units that you create count towards shi otherwise the state won't the state won't recognize them so yeah. the, i remember being on the board and there were members of the select board who were like well why do we have to do this because we're never going to get to 10 percent anyway and it was like, oh my God, like that's the mentality we're fighting against. And, and now we're at a place where it's like, well, that's actually really possible. Um, so I guess it, it might be worth considering maybe even workshopping this to decide what else we want from this. Yeah, that's that, possible. That's kind of what I was thinking. If we can get the planning in here and the, the reason why I would encourage that is because the MBTA zoning is coming down the pipeline, which could have substantial impacts on build out. 
um, and you know goals as far as what the town wants to look at as far as where they want to place density and things of that nature. Um, the other thing I'd like to see in the document, which we kind of neglected to do last time, is is to develop the narrative of you know how we got to the point we're at, um, and you know some of the information coming from professional sources perhaps lends a little bit more credibility to what some of us already kind of know. Um, and to have a document that you can point to and say, look, this is your town, this is how it got there. These are some of the impacts um, about which, you know, how, how you actually grew and built out. And these are some of the things that have happened since you've, you know, had density included. We didn't look at a lot of the non-affordable density units that are in town that you see on a regular basis as you're driving around and the impacts that those have had on the community. Um, you can do that inside a house in production plan. Um, so I guess it'd be a matter of developing the, um, the RFP in, to include some of these things. So if everybody wishes, I can spend some time with Chris and get a, a simple template draft of what we're going to be required to do so everybody knows what has to happen. And then perhaps we invite to the August meeting as many members of the, uh, the boards and committees that um, um, have a say in actual development, planning board and the ZBA, um, just to get some insight. You know, there's some institutional knowledge there that would be com very nice to uh, be able to include. And it's something we've never done in the past. So, do you get that data that Ed was talking about before you do the plan part, or is it all in one? Uh, Chris, go ahead. So I think. Um... The, the data is going to inform kind of the plan. So you, you would, you know, the consultant um, would go through the data and review that. And then that data informs kind of the narrative that goes out. Um, I just wanted to include um, to, to Ed's point, you know, I, I understand the frustration with um, the kind of implementation of these plans. Um, and it's not just the housing production plan. A lot of times there's, it's hard to get the follow through on these. Um, for those actually plan steps, and, and a lot of times they are pie in the sky. Um, but I think um, there was a model that um, a consultant provided for our housing product, or sorry, hazard mitigation plan um, that I think is a little bit more conducive. Um, and we should take a look at that. I think it's going to be much more achievable. It's a more robust implementation plan looking at um, kind of 10 to 20 achievable projects um, and really setting. Um, timelines, steps for those, and um, responsible parties. And, and I think um, something like that might be something that we want to look at for this next round. Eric? Yeah, um, just a, a question on how, like, the process of, of creating the, the, the plan um, Ed mentioned Karen, the consultant. Um, so like, do we, does the town and, and associated boards and committees provide a direction they want the plan to go and then the consultant kind of fulfills that? Um, or I guess I'm just wondering like, how prescriptive can the plan be versus just informational? Um, and then I'll, I have a, a comment based on the answer of that. Eric, it's, it's been done in a, co a di couple different ways. Um, okay. One way that I, you know, was exclusively the trust. So we engaged the contractor. She came in. She reviewed everything. We had, you know, some public comments. We, we, we spent a lot of time going through um, the document itself and what she was going to provide. Um, and then she went and did the diligence on her own to go to other departments, committees, and um, in the town um from a historical perspective to find where everything was. Um, and then we kind of gave her insight onto particular parcels that we were looking at. The time before that was kind of just like, okay, we just hired somebody, they just did something and we signed it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is what you want to add to it um, to make it a living, breathing document, so to speak. I um, mean, you, you kind of have to do what we did last time, which is, you know, probably spent a month and a half of back and forth with the consultant to make sure that she's gathering all the information that you're looking for. And eventually you send it over to the select board to be signed. We actually don't have the authority to sign it. We endorse it, goes to the select board and they sign off on it. I mean, yeah. We're in that process, of course, but they're the ones that actually sign it. Okay. All right. So then my second 
point uh, to make is, you know, I think it would be who the trust to come up with what it wants to see in the in the plan from a strategy standpoint, um, prescriptively. And, you know, in my head, I'm kind of seeing uh, the way to get more things accomplished is to try to pair up density with open space, um, like what's happening, you know, on, potentially happening on Pleasant Street. Um, so, you know, my preference would be we go to the consultant and we say, we want a housing production plan that is going to prescriptively uh, spell out how and why the town should be pursuing density paired with open space to accomplish multiple goals at the same time, along with, you know, if, if they can do this type of thing, like statistical information that shows that that denser developments actually burden infrastructure and other services less than sprawling single family neighborhoods. If I could see that in the production plan, I'd, I'd be really happy. Yeah. That's what I was getting at with that historical perspective, David. Yeah, if uh, you know, although I, I don't have a say in what you guys decide, but I, I very definitely is kind of, you know, thoughts in my head are kind of following up on some of the things Eric said, as well as others that, that we are currently, uh, we have launched a master plan update. Housing is a big section of the master plan. And I think a lot of the, a lot of what is of great interest to you in terms of the produ housing production plan is also something that needs to be aligned very closely with the master plan. And we, and you know, my, my intent is what I'm pushing for in the master plan is, is to look at a lot of the same things that you've just been talking about, you know, in, in terms of, of housing and the, the, the production plan may be a little bit more you know, focused on some specific goals, specific production goals. Uh, the master plan is perhaps taking a slightly looking at it from a slightly different angle, but I think we may be looking for much the same thing in both plans that, you know, we want to see, well, where, where is the town of Grafton today in terms of housing? How did we get here? Where do we need to go? Uh, and it's, you know, partly where we need to go is what housing do we need? You know, what, what, are the underserved you know, housing communities that we need to, you know, you know, where do we need to get more of a particular type of housing? Uh, from the master plan, we're looking probably a little bit more at where in town do we want to see what kinds of development. But there's a lot of opportunity for coordination and collaboration between these two plans. You know, and I, you know, and you know, Bruce, you alluded to that earlier, talking about getting, getting together with some of the other other boards that are relevant to the topic. And I think we very much want to try to you know, coordinate these two efforts and uh, you know, you know, avoid some unnecessary duplication of effort, but you know, focus focus each plan and where it needs to be. I just yeah, and just one thing, I just want to caution people when we're talking about plans. I, I agree, Dave and, and Eric, with the, everything that you said. Um, I, I just want to caution people that it, the planning part doesn't go so far as to encompass an idea that the town or this committee or trust can or ought to identify every single potential buildable lot that's out there and plan it out on, on a 50 year timeline. You simply can't do it. No, we you know, yeah. I mean, one of the challenges that comes along with housing is the, the concept that people ought to be able to do with their own private property what they want to do with their own private property. I, I thought that's what was called freedom. But um, people seem to have a problem with that. And we don't know when properties are going to come on the market and we don't know when the town is going to be offered a right of first refusal. So sometimes the town needs to have a long term vision about generally speaking, what kinds of development are you looking for? You know, what kind of infrastructure is that going to, to entail? You know, where and in what zoning can you put things to least inconvenience the people who will be inconvenienced and most affect the populations that you want to positively impact? But at the same time, this idea, and I, I heard this at the, one of the last meetings, is that, you know, oh, you know, somehow town government has failed because we didn't see 59 Pleasant Street coming. Well, look, the for sale sign's been there for a decade. Okay, I drive past it every day. But what we did, what I didn't know until I was on the board of selectmen, was that all of a sudden the town was going to be presented with this opportunity. We would have to decide, right then and there, what we wanted to do with this. So there needs to be, yes, there needs to be planning, um, but there needs to be also a, a, a certain agility to town government to encompass 
like all the sort of different changing factors that come along. Like, look, I've been asking for a master plan for a decade. By the time it's done, I'll be off this trust. Most of the board of selectmen, if not the entire board of selectmen, will be entirely torn through. I hope the town administrator is still here, but you never know. You know, if we had started this process five years ago, can you imagine? Like a completely different shift in focus. So yes, planning, great, wonderful. I'm, I, I've been all about it, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows that there's a certain limitation to what that's going to bring. And I, I think that's important, for the, not for the people that are on this meeting, because I think everybody here knows that, but for the people who are listening to this to understand what exactly it means to have a housing production plan and a master plan and what those the benefits are and what the limitations are. I just want to say that. Also, well just uh, these are very expensive enterprises, so there's absolutely no reason to spend twice. There's a, a, a fair amount of overlap, uh, like David mentioned, between the, the housing production plan and that kind of that focus or that section of the, the master plan. Um, I think the housing production plan is probably the most important piece if there was be part of the master plan. Um, because just to dovetail off of what these guys are saying, plans are great and all, but the town only controls a very small margin of what actually decides what gets developed in town. You know, if you look at our overlay district in South Grafton that's been there for over 10 years, you still see a big vacant lot. Um, you see a 40R that we did in, you know, North Grafton by the commuter rail. Um, that went relatively quickly, but the economy generally dictated what was going to happen. The density you're seeing in town is only happening because there happens to be an incredibly um, good market for it. Um, if you see inflation rates going in a different direction and trouble with financing, um, which is something we're going to talk about with GSX, with some of these large companies, um, the opportunity costs just aren't there anymore and you know they're doing other things. So as you're planning for one economic upswing, you might get a downswing and it might be 10 years and a complete overhaul of everybody who's in local government and completely new ideas, which why I kind of, you know, I've never been a big fan of the master plan. I've always been a kind of a big fan of the isolated bits of it that you can have some control. Um, and again, like anything else, it's just follow through. You can't, you know, and I can speak to this too. It's very difficult to stay on course with the plan. With most people don't even read the thing. Hmm. Yeah. Um, no. There's 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 really no point in making a plan if all you're going to do is sign off on it and then put it on the shelf. Yeah. yeah. And if you're going to make a plan, you want to try to make a plan that you can actually use in a practical manner, which means you know, you know, not trying to predict the future in any great detail, but more trying to you know set a bigger picture, set some you know, set some directions. Uh, plan, you know, in, in the context of development, I'm thinking more along the lines of, you know, what the town can reasonably do to incentivize, you know, or, or facilitate certain kinds of development whenever they happen to come up. So I, I like these things because it's, I think it sets boundaries and expectations. So boundaries, literally speaking, being, you know, zoning, zoning areas. So look, this is industrial. You can expect industrial to go there. This is residential. You can expect residential to go there. This is commercial. You can expect commercial to go there. And, and when people get up in arms about it, we can say, look, we came together as a community. We decided this is what goes where. And these were our goals. If you want to update these goals, by all, by all means, update these goals. What you can't do with these things, because they take so long in part, is get into the minute detail okay this block is going to be this this lot is going to be this well, it just no, it doesn't can't work do that, that way. it doesn't work that way it's not that yeah that doesn't work you're right. absolutely right so just so we're moving on from this to um something i could put on a follow-up meeting this won't be the meeting in two weeks so it would be the meeting a regular scheduled meeting in august um chris and i will sit down and, and go through an rfp um that outlines everything has to be there i'll send it all to everybody on the trust and then um, I'll reach out to the chairs of the particular committees and see if we can arrange, um, you know, a, a meeting amongst all of those individuals or as many as we can get in a room um, and then plan accordingly with some good deliverables and stuff we can take on to the next steps. Um, anything else in the ad? We're going to move on to the next bit. Great. Good work. Um, all right. So the next piece we have, this is something that Matt needs to, he's on vacation now. So he's not going to be able to give the presentation that was given to the select board. Um, it'd behoove everybody here to kind of review 
um, what he went through. And this is the Eastland applications for LIP, um, Pleasant Street and um, Upton Street. I, the, um, they should be in the packet, the presentation. I'm going to wait until the August meeting where he can actually present it on its own. Um, but I wanted to encourage everybody on the trusts over the next month just to kind of review it and get a general disposition of those two particular projects because their next step after the LIP process, of course, is going through the ZBA process and the, the variance process. And that's where I'm guessing they're, you know, somebody's going to want to tap us for support. Um, so I don't want to, you know, jump on Matt's toes because he, he put a lot of time and energy into it, but um, I have done some looking on my own. Um, and I'm, I'm I want to make sure that when, you know, we're participants in this process um, and the LIPS, you know, we should be integral parts of them, um, that everybody's happy with how these things um, came to be in this particular setting, because there are a couple more that could be down the road. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple more tonight that are LIP processes as well. And, you know, kind of going into this, I got the general feel that nobody kind of really knew you know how to make these things go and what to do as far as um, what to ask for and things of that nature and I'm worried that if a precedent is set and this is how you're doing um, the trust is going to be more marginalized as far as our input into the process um, so as it stands now kind of statutorily speaking it comes to us for some type of endorsement or recommendation um, of which the select board can use as it negotiates the process but as you're seeing in this particular proposal, um, and I'll let you, of course, you take this over the next month and do your own diligence so you come up with your own ideas on it, um, you know, what the town's asking for, um, what these things look like, you know, how embedded is it in the housing production plan, which is, of course, relevant because we're talking about it again, um, into what our goals and what we're looking for is what, what the town needs. Um, as a guideline to these projects um, and then you know look at the sums of money that are coming directly back to the town um, and you know offsetting sewer fees water fees and you know the actual implications of um, what we're getting out of these proposals um, you know and that's kind of a and b of the discussion items I just separated them so in case Matt was here you want to actually give the presentation um, but I, I you know, I want everybody to kind of understand this process because it's relatively new. Um, not in a sense that we haven't used it in the past for performance on 40B, but now that we're in Safe Harbor. Um, it's a completely different animal. Um, it requires a lot more thought um, because you really have to pay attention. And this, of course, means something for 25 Worcester Street because it's the same exact process that we're going to have to take when we put this before the select board. Um, I would say it's a little bit different as far as, you know, you know, what the town wants because it went through a town meeting process already. But, um, you know, the hard part is always this next phase that's coming up. Um, it's, you know, reaching out to the ZBA. It's actually showing up. It's actually providing, you know, the ZBA with our thoughts on it and the impact and how we think it's going to be beneficial for the town in its current form. Um, you know, because we've all seen these. When we when we talk about 25 Worcester Street and any type, we, we'll get 30 people in here. Um, and typically they're cross with us. Um, and then those aren't generally productive conversations that have any, you know, deep impact on what you're trying to accomplish in town. It leads itself to a whole bunch of different, you know, half-true speculation um, and, you know, that demonization of what you're trying to get accomplished. Um, they're you know, if we can take it, hit the pause button a little bit and actually genuinely reflect on what this means and the impacts that we want to see um, from a trust perspective, um, I think that would be helpful to the ZBA members in crafting their decision. Um, the other process, of course, is going to the planning board and saying, well, you know, we use that overlay in all sorts of different parts of town. Why aren't we looking at, you know, the overlay in those particular areas so it takes it out of the variance process which is something i know we've mentioned in the past but these projects are here now they're waiting we do have a couple months on this particular project i think before um it, it actually gets into the zba process i would guess at least two um but 
there are there are two separate ones as well. So, what is everybody's thoughts? And do you want me to just kind of table this to the next one so you guys can digest the proposal that was signed off on? And when we start with you. Well, I think we got to bring it up again so that we can go through the proposal that was just signed off on when when Matt comes in. Um, you know, I. I don't want to reinvent the wheel with this, certainly. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm taking the ZBA at their word that um, they're not hostile to, you know, these types of developments. Well, I, I don't think that they are. I, I think that a lot of the developments, the proposals that have come before them that fall within 40B have been difficult. I think, you know, Sotir's proposal up in um, North Grafton was a, a difficult row. Although, it's funny, I think he came in at like, you know, 50 units and they wanted 30 and it, and I said, you know, the number's 40 and everything's all the way 40. I mean, it can be that easy. I think it was unnecessarily difficult sometimes and due to some of the personalities involved. Um, but I, I think the, I want people to have faith in the process. I, I really do think it, it generally works out the way that it should. A lot of the things that people are concerned about, like design, I, I think people really focus on design the same way people in political campaigns focus on a slogan. Um, you know, it's not really what it's about, but at the end of the day, that's what that's what people focus on. Um, you know, open space, considerations of fit with neighborhood, considerations of traffic, considerations with environment are all addressed at every step of the way. And along the way, people really do have input um, into to be able to express their concerns. And believe it or not, the people that are on ZBA and the people that are on planning board and the people that are in this meeting are all neighbors and you know nobody here wants a bad development you know nobody here is trying to cram people in to where they won't fit or where there be a, a safety issue um so I, you know i think if we can just get a little bit more communication um between the boards and i don't know if it, it, it takes like a a joint meeting to like all have a kumbaya moment I, I i do have faith that you know these projects are going to proceed along a path that is statutorily mandated so that people will have the appropriate amount of input now my biggest beef with with what's gone on for the past two years with the public discussion about this is people seem to think that grafton is one big homeowners association where everybody gets to vote on what goes where you know what potted plant you put on your porch and what what color your door is i'm sorry that it's not you know if you want to have control over the lot that's next to you you got to buy it you know, otherwise, there is a process for your input. So, um, you know, and I hear what you're saying about the overlay. I just, I feel like that's a whole other bite of the apple that, you know, that might even be a little bit more difficult. Not that we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, but, yeah, those are my random thoughts about this. Anybody else have any input? Um, as part of our role in this as advocates for, um, you know, we should be supportive of Eastland's perspective as long as we're on board with it. Of course, we've already sent an endorsement letter that's saying that we are. Um, so as it starts to materialize and starts to take on its final form, um, which could be radically different than what we actually signed on for, it'd be who of us to kind of pay attention and follow it along. Um, I think, um, you know, go through the proposal as it stands now. Look at both parcels, um, you know, and, and have your thoughts on it, and then we'll we'll rally up again in the August meeting, um, and put together our endorsement letter um, for both separate projects, and then um, just you know think about it, watch a couple of the ZBA things. You know, the one caveat to this is we are in safe harbor, so there's a lot more discretion, and there's a lot less fear of the impact of being in the 40B sandbox, and saying no to something, and having hack just you know say no, you're. I mean, my tenure on the, the planning board, as we looked at subdivisions and things of that nature, every time you had a conversation on one of these subdivisions, it was, if you do, don't grant this, we are not in safe harbor, they can go a completely and radically different direction. Um, so if you look at um, the list of developments that the ZBA has heard over the past 10 years, which um, Billy Yomas was kind enough and Mr. McCusker was kind enough to uh, provide me when I decided I wanted to throw them all under the bus, um, you know, those things were out of safe harbor, and so tears was um, the one of, um, you know, a, 
particular density um, and a very hot button one that uh, spent a lot of time tossing around. And so, you know, one of these developments is 150 units. It's a fairly significant density piece and not something that you see a lot. Um, At least around here. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, everything's in context to, to graph. So I want to make sure that, um, you know, when we start working with the ZBA that they can rely on our expertise and um, know why these projects are good both in keeping us in safe harbor and in providing adequate housing um, for people in the Commonwealth, which is, you know, two very different lines and two very different ideology, but they both have a significant impact on people's thought process when they reach this, you know. As we've seen, some people say, you know, we've done, if we're at 10%, we've done our bit. Grafton doesn't need to do any more. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be your ideology. You've got to maintain that 10% for one. And two, there is a, you know, you know, part of the American dream is being able to own your own home or at least have a place with a roof over your head um, and not in squalor. Um, that's part of affordable housing as well. So... You know, we're just now at the point where, you know, we want to see these units come on board because we can start doing some very distinct things with them locally. You know, the town has never had, you know, the 150 affordable units where we can look at the things that we truly should be doing, which is, you know, veteran housing, municipal housing, local preference, all the things that we should be doing as a trust that we never had the ability to do in the past because deed-restricted single-family purchased homes um, at 80% in Grafton are well beyond people's means, um, uh, the demographic that you're trying to look at. Um, that new starting out teacher, you know, trying to find a uh, three bedroom for her or his, you know, significant other and their two kids, you know, or whatever. Um, you see quite a bit. So, like I said so many times in the past, the hard part is actually coming up now. All this theorizing, all this chat we do, listen to me, you know, drown on for hours and hours and hours on end, um, has kind of come to the point where we got to sit in the room with a bunch of hostile folks from a neighborhood, and we have to have a coherent argument in support so the ZBA can rely on educated individuals who can provide meaningful input to their discussion lines. Um, all right. Beat that one to death, and I pretty good. Good for me. We're all good points, though. Good points, though. Uh, all right. So, I know I packed a ton of stuff into this, so I apologize. And um, this next one should be fairly brief, but we do have a new administrative assistant who's um, going to be helping us. It's Amber, she's been on the um, those email chains. Um, we haven't quite um, clarified the role and the scope of the assistance that she's going to provide us in an overall set of hours. Um, when we looked at this in the past, you know, we spent eight months trying to find something and then just kind of said, okay, well, this isn't working. But at that point, we had already, the ship had sailed on getting a consultant for us. Um, so I have to meet with Evan. Chris and I are both going to meet um, and just kind of say, okay, well, this is how many staff hours are going to be available for us to use. Um, but what I want everybody here is to think about if it is a tool for us that will help us in administrative functions or if it, we want to grow it into something a little bit more than that. Um, I just wanted to have a brief discussion on what everybody's understanding of having staff support is and what we feel we need out of it, and then I can take that back to Evan. And then at our meeting in August, um, I'd like to just bring her in and introduce her because, you know, she's going to be taking over some of the roles that Chris and Natalia are doing, you know, planning the agenda and some of those type of things. But initial thoughts. Just happy to have somebody. Yeah, me too. <laughs> happy to have somebody uh, taking minutes instead of me. Yeah, fair enough. Dan's not going to want to give that up, though, is he? Well, yeah. he we we got her just in time for uh me and matt to uh get us back up to uh up to speed or uh back caught up on minutes so we we just we did all the work and then we and now she's on board so Sorry, going Bob. forward though it'll be good Brittany. no comments <laughs> eric 
Yeah, uh, definitely. I don't know. I, I think um, if we want to pursue some of the like social media stuff or outreach or whatever, you know, I would, that's only possible using paid staff in my opinion. So that's my two cents. Yeah, that's an excellent point. If we're going to have administrative function, if, if, if we get 10 hours a week of it, you know, do we want to say we want five hours of updating our website? and it's making sure packet material is readily accessible and our Facebook feed is alive and stuff like that. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And I, I assume she's going to be qualified to do that or at very least learn. Um, and all the learning can be done in the hours that are dedicated to us as well. Um, the other thing I'd like to, you know, her to spend a little bit of time on, um, or perhaps if Chris and Natalia have a little bit of free time, uh, I, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but, you know... <laughs> Um, going out and pursuing grants and things of that nature and finding other resources for us to fund besides the one resource that we have now, which is currently just CPA funds. Um, there are other trusts out there that, that have programs that they sustain via other grants and other models besides just straight up CPA. Um, and while we'll always get that 10%, and I hope we can negotiate for a little bit more than 10% um, as far as a reserve that's statutorily required, um, being able to build our coffers using other sources would be great. Um, especially now that we're getting a little bit more active and we're hopefully going to have some shovels in the ground on a project somewhere. So, um, anything else beyond what I heard tonight, just send me a straight email and I'll add it to the list of things I asked Evan. Uh, let's see. ZBA and planning outreach, I beat that one to death unless I really have anything more. I'm guessing not. Um, local preference and um, rental assistance program. Um, Eric had brought up, um, you know, some of this direction as far as programs that we should be handling internally that, you know, funds these things like we did during COVID, but on a more permanent basis um, and setting up policies and procedures to provide guidance. So we have the continuity of service. So as we get off the trust, those programs stay um, and the people who come to rely on them in any way, shape or form don't fall off the grid because the trust membership changes at a particular year, which of course is every two years. Um, so I wanted to see if anybody had some thoughts on it or if perhaps we um, subcommittee that out and um, or just give it to one particular trust member and I would recommend Eric on this um, because he's our attache to the CPC now um, in some way, shape or form. However, this has flushed itself out. Um, because they would be instrumental and the CPA does have a lot of programs statewide that um, we'd probably be looking to build off of. Um, yeah, just real quick. Um, thanks, Eric, for, for putting this back on our radar. Um, I looked up um, Mass Housing Partnership actually has a really great page called Data Town. And um, there's a really great, great slide I want to put out into the community I, as soon as I figure out where I, I want to put it. But it goes like this. Um, According to the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey from 2016 to 2020, um, data in Grafton on renters goes like this. 50% of Grafton renters are, are not burdened by their housing costs. 20% of Grafton renters are what they call cost burdened, which means you have to take into account, like, do I pay rent or do I pay this other bill? Um, you know, you're a paycheck away from being in crisis. Another 20% are severely cost burdened, meaning, you know, you really are robbing Peter to pay Paul and are existing in some state of crisis on an ongoing basis. And uh, the, the Mass Housing Partnership wasn't able to compute the, the final 10%. So for renters in Grafton, that's 40%, damn close to half of renters in Grafton are in some form of crisis about their housing costs. And, you know, and just for people who are watching this, you know, if you're out in the community and you're, you're going to your little league game and, you know, there's 15 kids on a team and all those kids are coming from different households, there's a sizable portion that, you know, the kids and the families around you that are in some crisis as they're sitting there on a Saturday watching their kids play ball. I just want people to, to be aware of that. Um, you know, not everybody is coming from the same place where they have let's say this and I'm going to get hit for it, the luxury of worrying about things like, well, you know, is the traffic on my road too much or is this going to change the view out my window? 
Like there are people who really are in very real crisis. And I don't want to diminish anybody's concerns. That's not what I'm doing. But there are degree of concerns. And, you know, when we talk about rental assistance, it's those, it's that degree of concern that we're talking about addressing. And I'm hoping that, you know, as we go forward in this and, you know, we see all our resources being spent on other projects, um, that we do have the support of the community and, and we can get additional funding to address the needs of those families who are in very real crisis. I just, real quick to add on to that is, to, you know, let's not, you know, classify, you know, you look at that statistic and, you know, in the back of your mind, I don't want people saying, well, you know, those 20%, you know, can't afford it, they shouldn't be there, demonizing them as they're, you know, they're not good workers or, you know, they're, you know, scamming a system or whatever. These are people that, you know, there's turnover. There's, you know, you lose a job um, and you're trying to raise a family in an environment or not. You're just trying to start a family in an environment and you lose that job. You know, rent is the first thing that, you know, can, can go. You know, typically speaking, it's a large percentage of a household income goes to where you, you know, you raise your, your kids, your family, or, or where you live if you're single. Um, these type of programs, you know, and we talked about this during the COVID crisis when we started the rental assistance, although we did get a lot of support from state and federal that kind of usurped a lot of what we were trying to do. I mean, our outreach wasn't there. We did keep people in their homes that are direct neighbors that needed help from their community around them and they survived and they continue to prosper in those particular environments. Um, and I think those programs are genuine and generally reflect the general disposition of most people is you want to take care of your neighbors and the people you live around. And this subset, um, this Grafton, um, is a pretty um, large community um, and there's nothing wrong with, with helping people around you. So Eric, I commend you on, you know, you know, getting this set up and also as you're looking at some of these different programs and stuff like that, make sure we pay attention to local preference. Because if we have staff and we have the ability to kind of dictate um, the waiting lists to get into these units, it should be something that we kind of also are doing as a trust. Um, especially some of these programs go and we, we're looking at, you know, 150 or 200 actual apartment units. Um, that's more than the entire inventory of our local Grafton Housing Authority in its entirety, whose wait list is a decade for certain bedroom counts um, of people trying to get in. Um, anyway, anybody else have anything more? We'll move to the next piece. I can add just a couple things too, but I want to give um, anybody else a chance to weigh in too. Oh, you bud. Dan. All right. Yeah. Uh, so appreciate the the general support. I think um, there's, I think a subcommittee would be good um, because in my mind, there's kind of like a, there's all these different populations that we could potentially serve with something like this. Um, and I think having a couple trust members to work through all the particulars of, you know, how this, how a potential fund would be structured. Do we need to have, you know, uh, separated funds for certain populations or can there just be one fund? And then, like you said, Bruce, the administration is, is going to be an issue um, just for the rest of the trust. Like I've been uh, talking to Jim Gallagher on the housing authority um, he's also on CPC. Um, and the, the good thing about potentially helping housing authority population is that they already have administration in place and we wouldn't have to farm it out to like that agency we use for the rental assistance. So that costs money to outsource the um, wait list management, qualification, all that stuff. Like that's not going to be our admin doing it. So um, I think it would be good to get maybe, you know, three, three people. Um, I'll do it alone if necessary, but um, if we could get three people that just, just tackle the, the rules, you know, what, what's available to us priorities, how, how the, something like this would be administered. I think it would be good. And then we can report back to the, the greater trust. Okay. Um, do we have any volunteers? 
Brittany just got up in the room, so that <laughs> Brittany <laughs> volunteered. <laughs> Strategic. <laughs> if you're not here, you can be volunteered, right? Yep. Oh, so Brittany, you're all in gonna... favor, Brittany. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, the dog's barking outside. <laughs> um, if, if nobody wants to be on the spot tonight, I can just pick three people. Yeah. All right, Brittany. Um, we were just mentioned. I don't know if you missed it, but he wanted to do um, a small subcommittee just to kind of um, coalesce around the different ideas and getting the rule sets in place. So, um, is that something that you can help him on? We'll. we'll I'll set the charge up and we'll get it voted on next meeting. And um, the good news is you can have your meeting minutes taken um, <laughs> as well. And I'll let you guys find a time and stuff like that. And who is the third candidate? I could do it if nobody else wants to do it. I think Ed wants to do it as well. Perfect. I didn't hear what it was, so I'm sorry. I... <laughs> Whatever it is, it's going to be right fun and not a lot of time. And, um, it's fun. Energy. Shouldn't be too yeah. much heavy lifting. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we're just going to get together, Brittany, to figure out like how we would structure and prioritize um, assistance programs, um, and, and just you oh, yeah. know for the for the general public that's watching too, it, it is not just restricted to rent. Um, CPA does allow for funding of mortgage payments as well, and a, a ton of kind of interesting things like you can we can help buy down mortgage rates for people that qualify, stuff like that. So. Um, overall assistance we just want to study it figure out what we could feasibly do um and and then we'll report back to the trust and you know just i like i like to help hear myself talk sometimes but i i think the good thing about the the assistance programs is you know part of the difficulty working on the trust is we're constantly trying to like time everything with these properties and these developers and parcels of land and there's a population that we don't have to time that just lives in Grafton and needs assistance when they lose their job and they can't make their mortgage or they lose their job, they can't make their rent. So it's a, it's something that we could, I think, implement a lot quicker um, than, you know, this difficult game we play trying to find the right development um, to make it affordable. And, and Eric, just real quick on that point, I, I do have a little bit of data I want to share on people with um, mortgages, homeowners. Uh, we're looking at almost a quarter of Grafton homeowners are either cost burdened or severely cost burdened. So, what was that uh, report again, Ed? It was like data something. Yeah, Data Town. It's it's fantastic. Data so if you go to the Mass Housing Partnership site, um, or you just Google Mass Housing Partnership and Data Town, it'll take you to um, all the, these this all this really great data about demographics, cost um, burden, home ownership. And you can even compare different communities. So you could stack up, you know, how are we doing versus Millbury? How are we doing versus Westboro? Which is what I'm going to do when I go home, I know. So, Right. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, last, I just got a quick update on GSX um, and this pertaining to the project that's on Upton Street, the old highway barn. Um, so they are in the process of moving from... Um, into an agreement with Beacon. Um, I did send something along to everybody. I'll add it to the packet for the next meeting um, as well. So they are basically um, under a memorandum of understanding now and in a diligence phase. Um, and what's happening is Beacon's going to come in and provide its resources to um, do what GSX was going to do. So from our perspective, it kind of puts a hold on everything we're doing until they figure out um, and can get us a new plan, a new highlight everything they need to do. It's basically reinventing the wheel to, in some regard. Um, take a look at the Beacon projects. Um, they're different style than GSX. They like to hold um, and keep properties inside their portfolio. Um, and how they take on leverage is a little bit different than GSX. GSX is kind of like, uh, you know, general and limited partners and then move on to the next one. Um, whether they hold on to the property or not, and that's kind of always the way they've been. Now, Beacon never um, bid on this, um, but that could just be because they never saw it, um, which happens. GSX was its only bid when we went for our first RFP. Um, it does go through a, um, you know, kind of a, a process, so it has to go back to the select board. The select board has to sign off on the assignment. Um, it's one of those, you know, the, it's not a second bite of the apple, so to speak, um, but they do get a say and who gets assigned it. 
So until we can have all that understanding in place, um, I've told them that we're kind of, you know, you know, we're in a holding pattern. So we're not going to approach sewer, we're not going to approach water district, et cetera, until we see how this is going to go. Um, Beacon's um, developments tend to be a little bit more um, working class, a um, little less filled with amenities and things of that nature, and more nuts and bolts affordability. Um, so typically when they design something, they're going to be at the 50% mark because they're relying on some of the resources that we talked about with Laura. They go directly to DHCD, they go to HUD, um, they use federal, um, tap federal money as well. Um, and where that has an impact on our grant is, you know, half of our money comes from CPA funds, which typically speaking um, are last in. Um, so if there are other grants or other underwriting that's going on that's um, forgivable or things of that nature, um, it's going to play a role in our position here. Um, so generally speaking, um, you'll get more affordability um, and probably a bigger spectrum of um, unit diversity, you know, so we can take another look at how many three bedrooms and two bedrooms are there and things of that nature. Um, the other thing that I had suggested is that the select board take a look at the barn. Um, the barn, of course, was part of the RFP process, and it was another one of those lemons that was kind of thrown in there with no real understanding of why. Um, the one thing that I could, I guess, discern from it was, um, it was the hope was that if the barn stayed in the RFP process, it could be negotiated out later, and what the town was utilizing the barn for at the time could be moved over to the highway barn on somebody else's dime, basically, is what it boils down to. Um, I did talk to John Stevens, who has roots in the Historic Society, and of course it's out of the district, um, but they had some thoughts on it. But as I'm reflecting on what happened when the actual RFP was designed before, I think it was mentioned by GSX that they like to make it into a brew pub of some kind, um, which I don't know if anybody in here has been in it, um, but it's not. It's not going to happen, um, and the RFP does not dictate that it does happen. So it's like you have to keep this. We don't know what you want to do with it. We don't know if you're even going to maintain it because there's no prescription in the details of the document that say they have to do something with it. So it can be another thing that in 10 years everybody's like, well, that building's falling down. Right. Why is that there? There's no restriction on who they sell it to. It's an independent lot. They can sell it to whoever they choose, or they can decide just, we don't want to take the maintenance cost on this. Um, all it says is it's going to be there. So I want to go back to the um, select board and have that thought process drawn out. Because um, as Chris and Dave can attest to, um, in our overlay districts, reserved parking can be accounted for as long as there's access between the parcels. And I think there's some negotiating room that if... Um, if we want to get from 1.5 parking spaces to 1.7, um, knocking that thing down and putting 25 spots there, uh, it's not only beneficial to the common because these can be reserved public parking, um, but it can also be beneficial to the hard part of that particular project, which is going through the special permit process with the planning board um, and convincing them that this is a good thing to sign off on. Um, I don't think Beacon is going to commit to anything luxurious on that barn. Um, all of this is going to be a, a maintenance item for them. Um, so they're just going to take care of it while they own it. But as I'm reading through the document, there's nothing that says anybody has to do anything with it but not knock it down. What's the rationale for that? I, so I, I guess at a, at a certain point, you know, it used to house, it housed uh, roadkill. It had some, um, at one point, it, I believe it had, no, it never had salt in it. That's this is the different barn. This is the barn that's right by the railroad tracks. Okay. Um, it had the street sweeper in it for a while. It had some maintenance equipment in it for a while. It was generally used for just kind of like a thing. Now it's got a bunch of junk in it, and there's like a mannequin that stares out the window at everybody. Yeah, we've got to preserve that. Yeah. It's historic. I, it, it's, <laughs> there's no real historic aspect to it that I found. Maybe as we, you know, we, we approach it again, somebody's going to come out of the woodwork, like in Hudson, and say, no. 50 years ago, there was a Warren article that said X, Y, and Z. Um, I have not found anything, but, you know, people's skills for digging back, you know, are better than mine. Um, I would say it's, it, there's a win-win here, and I think that was the thought process back then. 
was keep it on there and when they come back and ask to remove it you say oh yeah you can remove it because the select board has the authority and at the time the town administrator could have had the authority to say yeah well we why don't you just move that stuff over here and pay for another building over there and then we'll just let you knock it down instead of paying for it the horse training thing yeah that's dolores the mannequin she's historic so um <laughs> We'll see what happens. I think there's some there are better things we can do with it that are more cost effective that help us in the permit process and also um, subsequently help us with um, any parking issues that are, are up on the common. Makes sense. Um, anyway, we have some meeting minutes. Um, everybody had a chance to review them? Yep. So I will um, accept a motion to Approve the meeting minutes of February 10th, 2022, March 10th, 2022, April 14th, 2022, and May 5th, 2022, as drafted. So moved. We hear a second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor by roll call, starting with Dan Kusher. Aye. Brittany Morgan. Aye. Eric Swenson. Aye. Edward Prisby. Aye. And Bruce Benny is an aye, passing unanimously. Uh, that's all I got. I mean, I've got plenty more to say, but we can wait till the next time. I just want to quickly uh, thank uh, Matt, even though he's not here, uh, for uh, helping out with those uh, minutes. Thank you, Matt. Uh, he, he will be back for the next meeting. He'll be back for the next uh, meeting um, two weeks for the um, the MHP work that we need to do. So I'll bring him up to speed. All um, right. All right. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor by roll call. Dan Kusher? Aye. Brittany Morgan? Aye. Eric Swenson? Aye. Eric, oh, Eric Prisby. Edward Prisby? Aye. Wow. Uh, and Bruce Spinney is an aye. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I appreciate the people in attendance that hung through the whole thing. If you have any other concerns, direct them to the planning board, and we'll bring them up on the next meeting. <laughs>